It is not the crystallization of the moment that dominates us. The Slow Sliding of Pleasures is the title of one of the films by French writer Alain Robb-Grier, and the permanent sliding, the stream of consciousness and existence, appears in all his works. In the discovering of permanent evolution everything is possible, transformations are unpredictable. The past becomes a vague memory, a dream of existence. The act of remembrance twists and turns, changes it in the end. The memories of the past life become a farce, a dream of a lost freedom. To live for the past means to live on borrowed ground, out of existentialistic nothingness. According to the work of Alain Robb-Grier, it is important to honor the fleeting moment, the passing beauty of the sliding. It was the ambition of the French nouveau roman of the 50s, which was heavily influenced by Rob Grier's artistic and theoretical work, to eliminate the humanizing analogy that had been an important stylistic means of the period of realism. Rob Grier's novels concentrate on the detailed description of the surface of the events instead. His analysis of purely visible worlds is nearly mathematical in its use of correct size and proportion. Every emotional thought is bent, every simulated inner space ignored. The vision of the surface is similar to the camera's point of view. Rob Grier uh, forms pictures and tableaus out of his sentences. His novels are the logical sequel to Jean-Paul Sartre's La Nausée of 38. Compared to the intensity of the capturing of the isolated surface of the environment, seemingly all day phenomena become bigger than life in the verbal excess Rob Grier, pro uh, Rob Grier provides. As in La Jalousie from 57, his description of one and the same situation goes in circles, always returning to the nearly familiar point, a strange detail that always seems to change a bit. With the developing jealousy of the no-person narrator, a smashed insect on the wall grows bigger and bigger every time it is mentioned. The cyclical excess of description pushes the intensity of the officially absent emotions. Most of Rob Grier's novels take place in only a couple of hours, which are visited again and again. The author nearly teaches his audience, look again, look closer, it is not as it seems. Rob Grier defines the no-person narrator, the supposedly empty X of the story, as his absent ego. He represents the perspective of an eventually neutral observer of the events, the eyewitness, an archetype of the, uh, this author's work, his alter ego, the voyeur. In his work from La Maison des Rendezvous, from 65 on, Rob Grier's novels show a more and more obsessive uh, view on explicit sexual elements, mostly sadomasochistic psychodramas. These elements often were the empty spaces, the ellipses of his earlier novels, but with La Maison, which is an ironic variation of key elements of Pauline Riard's emblematic erotic novel L'Histoire de O, uh, The Story of O, these elements became the trademark of his writings and the films he made since 1961. This turn to explicit sexuality is eventually influenced by his film experiences, a new lust in creating fantasies. Other elements which define his oeuvre are exotic settings, especially Asia, the brothel, whips, chains and cages, beautiful yet mysterious women, enigmatic acts of brutal murder, rape, escape, secret agents, as well as executives of totalitarian regimes. The established miracles are never solved, the conventional endings are neglected. Our past is all too fragile, when you turn around to face it, it will fall to pieces immediately, he writes. Even in his autobiographical trilogy, Rob Grier never trusts his own memories. The past becomes a dream of existence, therefore the author confronts the historical events from a neutral, objective point of view. He tells his autobiography like one of his fictional prose, peppered with erotic fantasies and episodes from his novels. In effect, this technique is only the simulation of a narrative distance. Actually, Rob Grier's late trilogy is his most subjective work to date. His poetic and magical realism evokes the films of Jean Cocteau, a similarly cold and intellectual artist at first sight. On the other hand, his fantasies show allusions to the films of Jess Franco, who cites Rob Grier in Necronomicon, and Jean Ronin. 
Probably, Robguerier is the missing link between poetic vision, radical aesthetics, and excessive sexual rituals, even blood sacrifices. The complex montage of Alain René's early documentaries and essay films always had been similar to the fragmented collages in Rob Grier's texts. It came as no surprise that René showed an interest in working with Rob Grier. Therefore, René directed his second feature film after the Cineroman last year at Marienbad 1961 by Rob Grier. With well-composed images, luxurious decorations and ambitious camera work by Sacha Virney, René opens the first cinematic view on Rob Grier's visions. The film is a very abstract reflection about memory and imagination, de desire and deception, and last but not least about cinema itself. On the other hand, Last Year at Marienbad is a pure visual trip into the non-logical universe of, Ro of Rob Grier. One year later, Rob Grier made his film debut by directing a screenplay he originally wrote for René, L'Immortel, uh, in 61. This dreamlike fable of the desperate search of a man, N, for a mysterious woman shows Rob Grier's very own vision of cinema, as he had been a bit disappointed by the René uh, adaptation of his scenario, especially because René took out the explicit rape scene the author thought of as being essential. So L'Immortel, his own film, varies the enigmatic games of Marienbad in the Istanbul setting, replacing the elegant camera movement by alienating static frozen black and white shots, often in wide angle. Rob Grier realized his idea of an intellectual montage by only playing with recognizable narrative elements which are often presented as clichés. Seen as a whole, this film represents um, to um, Seen as a whole, this film seems to embody the mystery of the city of Istanbul for a Western European viewer via the desired woman that eventually dies in a car accident in the beginning. As it is the law of the circle, N has to die the same way too. In some of Rob Grier's subsequent films, his friend Jean-Louis Trintignant appears as a sinister stranger. His star appeal brought the difficult arthouse works to international attention. Trans-Europe Express from 66 is much more ironic than his predecessor and shows most of the actors in different roles. Yet another game. Even um, Rob Grier and his wife appear in the roles of a film director and his assistant. For the first time he uses the genre pattern of the crime film novel, like unlike his, not unlike his mystery novel La Maison de Rendezvous, and some of the Trans-Europe Express elements will appear in his later novel a project for a revolution in New York. According to its setting, The Train, an allegorical place of the rite of passage, this film can, seen, um, can be seen as a creative work in progress. A director, his writer and the producer board a train and begin to invent a gangster scenario which is inspired by the presence of a famous actor, Jean-Louis Trintignon. Scored by the music of La Traviata, a cryptic gangster plot unfolds and leads to another string of events. Trintignant plays the sadomasochistic criminal Elias, which is Elias as a pun, who tries to smuggle some dope to Antwerp. In the end, the two levels of narration meet again. Trans-Europe Express was the director's first commercial success, probably due to a rough rape scene including bondage play, a sequence that is finally marked as fictitious. Unlike L'Immortel, this film includes some psychological acting, not only the usual poses of the no-person narrator. The Man Who Lies from 68, again presenting Jean-Louis Trintignant's eventually Rob Grier's most perfect filmic adaptation of his literary, literary theories, followed by a very dynamic handheld camera, the film shows the events around the escape of the liar, called Boris Varissa, who is followed by Wehrmacht stormtroopers. He is searching for his former comrade Jean Robin, also a common name in Rob Grier's prose. Again and again Varissa tells the story which led to his escape, but each time the facts differ. The individual creates uh, himself all the time, dis uh, desperately trying to give himself a history, a very pessimistic view on history in general. 
The multiple personality of Varisa is the prototype of Robgerie's narrator and hero. An objective world is non-existent, even when the narrator is executed halfway through the film. Three years on the writer-director made his first color film, Leden et après, Eden and After, which also came out in the even more fragmented and confusing version of N après l'idée. The purely audiovisual non-dramaturgical narration um, circles around a group of young students who organize strange rites of passage, initiations that appear like pagan sacrifices and uh, ritual rapes. The narrator this time is female. Violet, uh, played by Catherine Jordan, travels through dark industrial eras and deserts of the Far East only to encounter a stranger who changes his identity permanently. Even the exposition of the film confronts the viewer with some keywords game, blood, rape, Eden, sex, labyrinth, and subjective. These words mark the playground of Rob Grier's sadomasochistic and at the same time highly theoretical filmic experiments. Again, literature and film melt in his hands, and Jean um, Améry, the famous writer and philosopher, criticized especially this film for its hypocritical use of intellectualized glorification of sexual violence. The luxury of the voyeur seems to make him untouchable for the truth of the torture, as he writes. Consequently, Rob Gaillet found the essence of his new work in Jules Michelet's Inquisition dra a document La Sorciere, which he transformed into the psychological phantasmagory uh, The Slow Slidings of Blasher, Glissement Progressif du Plaisir. Like The Man Who Lies, uh, The Slow Slidings circles around the desperate reconstruction of the past. A young girl supposedly killed her elder girlfriend and in is interrogated by a police detective, again played by Trantignon, a cardinal and a judge. The film intercuts the interrogation and seduction sequences with violent visions of torture and inquisition. The girl reflects the situation of the suppressed female of Michelet's prose. However, the victim manages to play with her inquisitors, who in the end go crazy. By permanent variation of the truth, she destroys every reliable system. This lone adolescent, most of the time naked in her aseptic cell, is eventually Rob Grier's incarnated hope for the destruction of the rational dictum. Uh, the uh, main actress, Anise Alvina, also appears in his tasteful and amusing gangster comedy, Le Jeu avec le Feu, Playing with Fire, 1975, an ironic kidnapping drama which Rob Grier produced with his own money and realized in the rooms of the Paris Opera House. The core of the story refers to the real-life story of Patty Hearst, who switched over to the side of her kidnappers. Formally, the film is structured by musical pieces, while it again plays on the variation of illusions and lies. As the father of the victim plays the key role of the intrigue, the film was at one point to be called Opera Incestuosa. Another structural element here is the idea of the doorways to different rooms, representing places of forbidden pleasures. Rob Grier saw this as a Marquis de Sardian theme. While Playing with Fire is one of the, his most expensive films, it also has a significant appearance by Sylvia Christel, who at the same time became a star with Emmanuel, which worked for the marketing of Rob Grier's film on the work, world market. Alain Rob Grier directed one more film in that vein, La Belle Captive, uh, The Beautiful uh, Captive from 1983, a dreamlike companion of his usual motives filmed by Henri Alecon and worked as a writer and consultant on the film Un Bru Qui Fou in 1994, as well as Raoul Servet, um, a semi-animation film Taxandria. While uh, the former one varies the story of the Flying Dutchman by using elements of La Maison de Rendezvous, La Belle Captive has long been la his last genuine effort, a crossover of vampire and detective story that uh, already appears like the over aestheticized farewell from the world of his hermetic cinematic vision. 
In 2006, he followed his strange career with Gradiva, another amofu of a middle-aged historian traveling Marrakesh, obsessed by a mysterious young woman in different incarnations. While the film still followed the path of cyclical rituals of desire and submission, Gradiva already feels fallen out of its time. Honor Grier can be seen as one of the few multimedia artists who eventually can create a dialectic relationship between literature and film. Similar to the self-referentiality of postmodern culture, he recreates an open universe of quotes, references, alliterations, allusions and fakes that transgresses the borders of the medium, integrate related art forms and exchange specific techniques in the media exchange process. The way film freezes to become a tableau, photographs come to life and characters doubt their own identity. He writes books supplying photographs by David Hamilton, based on paintings by René Magritte, and then he makes a film out of this experience like La Belle Captive. Rob Grier's literature is film-like in the detailed description of the surfaces as his filmmaking is like literature in the intellectual playfulness and theoretical fragmentation. As Jean Amery writes, filmmaking was the logical conclusion of Rob Grier's optical descriptions because written words have a border, a virtual frontier, that the motion pictures can probably transgress. The literature-inspired imagination of the reader is dependent on his personal experiences and at best creates an individual always changing film in the reader's mind, a fact that led Roland Barthes to the conclusion that the author dies with the reading of his text. If there is a dialectic between film and literature, Anna Robgrier oscillates on the waves of the media. The visualization of his verbal artifacts again points out the radical subjectivity of the nouveau roman. The secret personal point of view is in fact already established between the lines. The moment of delirium is all too evident in moments when the richness of the description in his novel becomes excessive as mentioned above. But even more than his writings, the films of Alain Robb-Grier are the incarnation of a deeply eroticized and at the same time intellectualized vision du monde. Georges Bataille's idea of transgression became Alain Robb-Grier's very own model to, to transcend an enlightened humanity.